Finally, um, I got my presentation. Um, so I would like to thank first the organizer for invited, inviting ESPID um, speakers um, to this session and the audience to be there so, um, with so many people to listen to us. Um, I will talk to you uh, in the next um, half an hour or a little bit less about um, antibiotic treatment for otitis media. Um, as you are aware, there are many discussions about these treatments, and I will try to raise uh, some issues um, with you. First, uh, the slides that I was asked to show you about the potential conflict of interest, um, some conflicts of potential with the companies, but also with affiliations to scientific societies or personal belief, like not belonging to any anti-vaccines associations. Old disease, yes, otitis media is clearly a, a very old disease. It was found um, traces of otitis media uh, in old Egyptian mummies already, which was uh, with fossilized tympanic um, temporal bone with a hole, showing that that person didn't die from it, but had an otitis media while living. And it's still a very common infection with almost all children before three years of age that will have at least one episode and a substantial proportion of these children that will have recurrences of otitis media, and in some of them, it will be many recurrences. So where are the consensus and controversies now uh, for otitis media? We know and we're increasingly aware of the fact that the diagnosis is extremely challenging. We also know that the benefit of antimicrobials is really uh, limited, and I will talk a little bit more about that. There are adverse uh, events from antimicrobial therapy that may sometimes offset the benefit, especially if you take into account the antimicrobial resistance problem and the appearance and increasing um, number of multi-resistant strains of strep pneumonia, but also of Haemophilus influenzae, which is another um, pathogen causing otitis media. And the other problem with that is the fact that we don't have many new antibiotics coming up uh, in the pipeline. Clinical diagnosis is difficult. All pediatricians and GPs are perfectly aware of that. It really depends on the quality of the material you have to diagnose otitis media. You need a good otoscope. Ideally, you need a microscope. You need to remove the cerumen, which is very often present. You have hairs in the ear canals. Practitioners very often are not well trained to diagnose otitis media and recognize it. And very often you don't see very nice and, I'm sorry, very nice and cooperating children like that one, but mostly crying children like that one, which is not so easy to examine. And very often both pediatrician but also ENT specialists will overdiagnose otitis media. Well, to illustrate the diagnosis, you rarely see so nice images in your clinical practice. And if that one is an undoubtedly pus uh, behind the eardrum, that one is just liquid, and it's so, not so easy to make a decision on that one. There are some evidence in support of antimicrobial use in otitis media. First, mostly, most of the episodes will be caused by at some points by bacteria, and the main bacteria involved will be strep pneumonia, we have talked about it in pneumonia, but also non-typable Haemophilus influenzae, they will share the uh, cake between them, causing mostly 80% um, of the otitis media. We also know that the symptoms, the main symptoms like pain and fever, will disappear more rapidly if you give antibiotics, and then you will reduce the number of treatment failures, particularly in young children below two years of age. We also um, think that, uh, and we know that antibiotics will reduce complication of acute otitis media, and it's certainly, so far, a quite cheap treatment, and it's easy. The natural history of otitis, you see uh, in yellow, that's the, the evolution of children who don't receive antibiotics as compared to children receiving antibiotics. And what's happening is that they will basically, most of them, evolve towards cure, but the cure will be more rapid and it occurs more often in children that receive antibiotics. In the meta-analysis that 
looked at the studies that compared antibiotics against placebo for otitis media, it was shown that two-thirds of the children will recover from their main symptoms of pain uh, with or without antibiotics. And in the placebo arm, 80% of the children will be pain-free at the end, even though they didn't receive any antibiotic treatment. The difference between the antibiotic-treated patient and the placebo-treated patient is not that big, and in that meta-analysis, it was only 7%, meaning that 15 children have to be treated with an NNT of 15 to prevent one child from having symptoms at the end of the iteration of observation. Importantly, there was no impact on long-term hearing or recurrences of acute otitis media and there were more adverse effects uh, associated with antibiotic treatment. This led to what, what is called the observational approach, where you wait for 48 to 72 hours before you start your antibiotic treatment. What happens when you do that? What we see is that in reality in these trials, two out of every three families will not give antibiotics to their children. They will wait and the child will improve and no adverse event were associated with the almost 3,000 children that were assigned to the wait-and-see group. However, in some cases, children had still fever and pain and had to be given antibiotics. Overall, this strategy led to high parental satisfaction. To go further in the analysis, the, uh, another meta-analysis was conducted to look at exactly which children could benefit most from antibiotics among the whole group that was studied in the first uh, previous meta-analysis. And they found that basically children with specific symptoms of otorrhea or children with bilateral otitis media in children less than two years of age, again, age is an important factor, uh, it's clearly a much more benefit of receiving antibiotic with an NNT of three to four, meaning that three to four kids had to be treated with antibiotics to improve one kid. This was confirmed recently in two very good studies that were published uh, uh, jointly in the New England Journal of Medicine this year, uh, where they studied young children. They did not exclude severely ill children as they used to in the previous studies. And what they observed is the fact that in the children that were in the placebo group, as compared to children treated with amoxicillin and clavulinate, they were a much higher rate of treatment failure. And a third of these children had to receive a rescue antibiotic treatment. So clearly a benefit in favor of the antibiotic treatment as compared to placebo. The other study that was published together with that is the study conducted by Oberman in Pittsburgh in the US, and they used a severity score and showed that since the beginning of the otitis, you see in the blue line, it's the children treated with amoxiclav. The red line is a placebo group. The difference is not that big between the two groups in terms of severity score, but at every, time, at every point in time, the score was higher in children that were receiving a placebo, meaning that there was a benefit from antibiotic, but the benefit is small. Early antibiotics produce complication. Well, mastoiditis is not always preceded by an otitis media, so that means it's not always obvious, and now it has become rare in developed countries, and it's much more common in developing countries. The epidemiology has changed a lot over time, and if you look at history in industrialized countries, you see that in a century ago, we had a lot of mastoiditis, and clearly antibiotic treatment was really necessary um, for preventing mastoiditis to occur when there was an otitis media. This was going down with time, and we don't know exactly how old the reason why this has gone down. Probably a change in pathogens, shift from group A strep to strep pneumonia is a partial of the explanation. But in recent years, you see the rates. There's still a benefit from antibiotics, but it's very low rates. And if we look at the number of children in that large uh, UK database, they looked at the children that received treatment for otitis media and the number of children that developed mastoiditis. 
Look at the risk of mastoiditis. It, it is increased if you don't give antibiotics for otitis media systematically, but the number of children you need to treat to prevent one mastoiditis episode is extremely elevated. And in terms of public health, this is not acceptable because there is an access to care and mastoiditis is a perfectly curable condition. But it's true that antibiotics do half the risk of mastoiditis. So let's look now at the arguments for the uh, initial observation uh, strategy. The benefit of antimicrobial therapy I showed you is small, and in many cases, otitis media has become a self-limited disease, so you don't have a risk to see a child die because you didn't treat the child with antibiotics. Also, otitis media is, in children and in pediatrics, the first reason for giving antibiotics to children. And this clearly increases the resistance of many pathogens, and some of these pathogens are very relevant pathogens. David talked to us about the role of strep pneumonia in pneumonia, which is a life-threatening disease. And if we go on using antibiotics so much, we will lose our um, uh, antibiotic weapons for a uh, disease like pneumonia as well. So we always need to weigh the benefits for and against an attitude. On the one hand, we have the um, number of needed to treat children um, overall in otitis when you give systematic antibiotic treatment for otitis, and you have the adverse events that you need to take into account. Uh, giving antibiotics individually will give diarrhea, vomiting, or rash, and you will harm a substantial number of children, as shown here. But don't forget that in children, in subset of children less than two years or severely ill, the number needed to treat goes down very much. Again, data from the Oberman study in New England showing that a quarter of the children with um, the amoxicleft treatment group will have uh, diarrhea during the treatment. So these adverse events are not so rare, and some of them um, are conducted to stop the treatment. Another adverse event of antibiotics is the societal cost of um, using these drugs and the fact that we have increasing resistant problems. We know that over the world and over Europe particularly, there are huge variations in antibiotic use, and usually um, southern European countries use a lot of more of antibiotics than northern European countries. And this is not translated into uh, more problems of mortality or morbidity in northern European countries. We also know that there is a clear correlation between antibiotic resistance and antibiotic consumption, and we also know that otitis media is the most uh, common reason for prescribing antibiotics in children. These are German data where you clearly see that uh, otitis media is the first reason for prescribing antibiotics in children, and these are uh, US data, and you see that over time it went down a little bit, and this is a Titus Media prescription, but it's still the leading cause for prescribing antibiotics. The consequences of that, if you compare two countries like Germany here and France, in Germany, 40% of children get antibiotics when they have a Titus Media. In France, almost all of them. Look at the resistance of strep pneumonia to penicillin. The rate is very low in Germany, whereas it's very high in France. In fact, what we see with uh, antibiotic prescription in otitis media or respiratory tract infection in general in children is the more you prescribe antibiotics to these children, initially they are colonized with susceptible bugs, but the more you prescribe, they would progressively get colonized with first intermediate and then fully resistant bugs. And what we should not forget is the fact that these children are the one that disseminates their bugs over to their parents and grandparents, and the elderly might get even more severely ill than the children themselves and with resistant bacteria. So the more diagnosis of otitis media you make, the more treatment you will give, and the more resistance you will get. And we will get to situations which are still exceptional like this one, where you have virtually no oral drug against 
uh, strep pneumonia isolated from middle fluid from children. This, uh, this case has come from the United States, but we, should, we certainly could find some in other countries. And the only drugs that could be used in this situation are quinolones or vancomycins, and quinolones are not licensed for use in pediatrics. Same situation in France, where you see these difficult to treat atitis media, basically most strains resistant to uh, penicillin or intermediate, but even in Haemophilus influenzae, half of the strains were resistant to ampicillin. There have been attempts, and many attempts, campaigns to reduce antibiotic consumptions, not only for hepatitis but for um, many other diseases as well, and use, um, have a rational use of antibiotics overall. And many guidelines issued in many countries. This table um, presents you only some of the guidelines. Some of them are missing, I know that. But just to illustrate the fact that there are wide variations between countries, and usually uh, under six months, no problem. Everybody recommends antibiotic use. Over 24 months, everybody over, overall agrees that we can wait a little bit. The problem and the discussion occurs for the children between six and 24 months, where you have a wide variation between optional, recommended, systematically, etc. In the US, there have been efforts made to reduce the antibiotic prescription for hepatitis media, and what happened? The prescription rate has been reduced a lot, but, what, but not the proportion of children that are prescribed antibiotics, which is still 80%. What does it mean that children are still prescribed antibiotics for hepatitis media when it is diagnosed, but the number of diagnoses have gone down, which is a good thing? However, you can still decrease the proportion of children which are treated. You don't really need to treat 80% of the kids. Um, they go well in the Netherlands, and they treat only between 40 and 50% of the kids uh, with hepatitis media, and what they use is amoxicillin rather than a broader spectrum drug. So, in summary, the indication for antibiotic use in hepatitis media, there are some indications everybody will agree on. Very young children, children with immune deficiency, children with recurrencies, uh, if you are not certain of the compliance or access to medical care, you will have to treat these children and specific conditions as well. The question remains, and the debate will remain with children below two years, it's certainly important to have a certain diagnosis to treat your child, otherwise you will overtreat many children who don't need it and who will have no benefit. But certainly there are different attitudes that, you can, um, that are valuable in that situation. So the take home messages is the accurate diagnosis of acute hepatitis media is essential. What you treat with antibiotics needs to be a bulging tympanic membrane in a child with an acute episode of fever and ear pain, which is really an otitis media and not just an upper respiratory tract infection. Complications are not an issue in industrialized countries. It's not the same in developing countries where mastoiditis and meningitis are still important complications. And we desperately need re to reduce antibiotic use. Otherwise, we will go uh, for an ecological catastrophe all over the world. And we are left with a problem which is not solved so far, even with the two marvelous studies in New England, that we cannot identify exactly which are the children that will benefit from antibiotic treatment for acute otitis media. So in that situation, prevention clearly appears like an attractive option, but I have no time to go over prevention this time, and it's a lot of debate over that as well. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne. Uh, excellent summary in such a short time. Questions? Just open the floor. I, I would ask you uh, on your uh, question on the prevention, on, on what do you see as the role of the influenza, seasonal influenza vaccine in, in preventing acute otitis media? Is, is there a cause for that? Well, um, David just said that there is one, uh, but there are controversial data in the literature. We have basically two big meta-analyses, and one says that there is no benefit and the other one says there is a 50% reduction. So um, I think we need an, a new meta-analysis and really uh, going back into old studies and, and probably differentiating better uh, the um, live attenuated vaccine, which is probably much better than the inactivated vaccine. 
which has not been done so far in the meta-analysis. So there's probably a role, but it's very difficult to interpret because influenza season will vary from one year to another. Um, and so it depends on the year when you've made your study. Excuse me. Recurrent otitis media in cold season. We don't give the patient antibiotic and pneumococcal vaccine. Do you mean chronic antibiotic treatment? Well, for, for children with recurrent otitis media, the there is certainly an indication to vaccinate them, but you need to vaccinate them before they have had their first episode of otitis media. It has been shown in several studies that if you wait until they've already uh, have episodes of otitis media, it's already late and you will not have the benefit from the vaccine because they will have biofilms in their ears and they will still have new episodes of otitis media. The most important thing is really to prevent the first episode of otitis media. So the sooner you give the vaccine, the better it is to prevent otitis media. The other thing about um, long-term antibiotic prophylaxis, it's not recommended anymore. The um, problem you have from antibiotic resistance clearly overweight the benefit you get from uh, prophylaxis for the, the overall winter. What do you think of, of, of infectious uh, susceptible children not to be taken to the daycare? Is, is that a way to prevent them from getting otitis? Is there data on that? So um, taking children out of daycare, um, that's uh, certainly uh, a, good, a good way to prevent otitis media. I mean, we know if we put children in daycare, they will get more episodes of otitis media. But uh, it's not necessarily feasible in all countries, and it's not an easy option. It's also um, difficult for women that are working, um, so it, it works. But um, we know also that there is a number of hours. I mean, if you don't go over 20 hours, some studies said, um, it's acceptable. If you can spread the time they spend and if you can put them in daycares where they, there are not too many children to avoid overcrowding, that's all, okay, that can also improve um, the benefits, but it's still a limited action. And I, personally, as a woman, I, I don't think it's a good option uh, because it really prevents women from going to work. About the uh, role of uh, non typable uh, uh, Haemophilus influenza and otitis media, and the new uh, uh, protein D carrier for some of the um, conjugate pneumococcal vaccines and its reduction in our country, Saudi Arabia, there are some studies that reduced otitis media in an instance of 30%, 30% of cases. Is this really true or it is just a commercial um, uh, label for the company? Uh, did the introduction of PCV vaccination uh, with protein D carrier from uh, an anti bubble HIV is effective or not? Okay, so we have um, uh, indeed a vaccine with a protein D carrier from uh, NTHI. And there is one study which is certainly true. It's not a false study, and the results are certainly valid. Uh, there was a very nice reduction of the number of episodes of hepatitis media, but um, we don't know. It's not fully clear from that study whether the effect was more um, of an increased effect on strep pneumonia than on NTHI. It's, there might be an effect coming from protein D, but this has to be confirmed with other studies. And these studies are ongoing, but we don't have the results yet. Um, the concept is there, and it's important. It's certainly a very nice and interesting and attractive future option. Um, and the POIT study is certainly a study that um, I would consider as valid. Um, pneumococcal vaccines, as, ex as they this note, do help in preventing a lot of otitis media. But again, you need to administer the vaccine before you have the infection, and even more for Haemophilus influenzae, because they form biofilm in the ear, and um, you will need to intervene before the biofilm is formed. Otherwise, you will have no impact. Um, importantly, um, there are some studies ongoing, and I would um, certainly look forward to the results, where there was a combination of the um, 
PCV13 vaccine and the protein D vaccine in Aborigines in Australia, where they have a lot of chronic suppurative otitis media. And uh, I will be very happy when we see these results. But there are certainly good uh, theoretical uh, ground to have these studies ongoing because it's probably something promising for the future.